Grace, peace, and mercy to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I, uh, I don't talk about Nebraska football on Sunday mornings very often um, because uh, some people follow football or sports religiously, if you know what I mean. Uh, I'm not one of them, um, but there's a theme in our Old Testament reading today of waiting, and it seems that uh, Nebraska fans um, know a little something about waiting. Uh, we, I don't know if you watch the game or if you follow, but uh, yesterday was kind of a, a game that we've been waiting for for a while. Um, uh, a game not only of, of just a, a win, a victory, but, um, but a good one. Um, a, a good-looking team, a, a team that's, uh, that's really, uh, well, that we've been waiting for. Um, this, is, this is also something, though, that it's, it's just one win. As you're sitting here thinking, yeah, you know, maybe you are a big fan, and, and, uh, and it's one win, but, but you want the big win. You want the final victory, right? You want the national championship. Um, there's just been years of waiting. Right? Years of uh, waiting with great expectation, high expectation, sometimes low expectation. Um, but there's a couple things that have happened. And as you maybe consider yourself, or maybe folks you know, there's a response that fans have had in that period of waiting. Right? There's, there's some fans that have, uh, well, they're tired of waiting. And maybe it happened a year ago, or two years ago, or five years ago, or maybe it happened uh, earlier this season. Um, but there's a few fans that have just gotten so tired of waiting that they have, uh, they have turned away. Um, they've traded in their, their Nebraska red for uh, uh, the crimson color of Alabama or Oklahoma or something. Um, because they want a victory now, right? They want a winning season now. And so they've, they've turned away. Um, there's other fans, and you know them, that have grown really critical and bitter. Um, even of, a, uh, well, of the whole process. And so you'll hear them speak about, uh, they still say they're fans and they still watch the game. I don't know why, because it usually just makes them angry um, and, and bitter and they criticize and, and poke at you know, the team. And, and then there's probably other fans that have just kind of patiently been waiting, still hopeful, um, waiting, watching for the, the next year, the next game, the next season, the next so on. Um, hopefully not the next coach, um, not too quickly anyway. Anyway, that's, that's, that is a theme that is really present in this Old Testament reading. Um, but it has something much more to do with, with a great victory, not a sports victory, not entertainment, um, not a college football team, but, but the greatest final victory ever. Right? It's, it's, uh, uh, and I would love for you to follow along. Um, it's, we're going to look at the book of Malachi and a couple of different verses. Uh, Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament, and so it's a little easier to find. Um, if you find yourself at Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, just go back. Um, if you find yourself in any other Old Testament book, just go forward. So right at the, at the break there. Um, so Malachi... Um, the, the book of Malachi is interesting, especially it's highlighted for this last Sunday of the church year. Uh, if you were here last week, you heard me say this, and I'll say it again. The last part of the church year um, is a description of the return of Jesus Christ. Uh, both of our texts, even though this is an Old Testament reading, it's pointing to waiting on the Lord, waiting on Yahweh, waiting on this victory, waiting on on his final judgment. And so the book of Malachi is a great example of seeing what happens when people wait. Now, the book of Malachi also is very specific, and it points out what happens among sinful people when they wait on Yahweh. Uh, and it's not good. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a description of, uh, well, it was written a long, long time ago, but it very much applies to why or how we wait today. Um, and, and give it some titles, um, Bold, Bitter, and Blessed. And we can see in the text here that it describes these three categories. And as you listen, I don't know that you can put yourself in one, um, but you can probably see yourself in all three. And, and so just, just listen. First of all, I want to read to you uh, Malachi chapter 1, verse 13. Um, 
It's, it's describing those who are bold in their turning from God. They're tired of waiting. Uh, they're tired of waiting on God to come and rescue them. In a New Testament understanding, we'd say we're tired of waiting on God to come and, and give final judgment. Uh, tired of waiting on God to come and judge that person over there. Right? Tired of waiting on God to come and give us our reward. Um, and so some people would boldly turn against him. It says this. This is uh, one, chapter 1, verse 13. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord. This is Malachi's description of some of those. You say it's too hard to serve the Lord, and you turn up your noses at my commands, says the Lord of heaven's armies. If you look down also at chapter 2, verse 17. You have wearied the Lord with your words. How have we wearied him, you asked. You have wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight, and he is pleased with them. Well, see, here, here's a description of those who have, at times, totally turned from following Yahweh, totally turned from waiting on Jesus, and in the process have boldly turned towards sin, because it seems to bring a greater reward, and, and then call it right. Now, now, this is a, a terrible thought and a terrible uh, a thing to apply to our, ourselves, but we know that at times it's just absolutely true. We're tired of waiting, tired of watching, tired of seeing other people seem to do well while we do poorly, in whatever way we would describe, and so boldly turning against him. There's the one category, maybe it fits you, and maybe it doesn't. Let's look at the second one. The second one, not boldly turning against God, but those who have grown bitter. Uh, and, and now I've got to warn you, though, that those who have grown bitter um, are also named among the people of God. In fact, it's a, it's a description of a warning to the priests. Now, you might see that that would give me a great warning, and it does. But our New Testament understanding is that you are all priests, priests of God, the priesthood of all believers. And so it's a stern warning in chapter 2, um, about halfway, about verse 4 and 5, it describes those who would not call out and warn those of the coming of, of Jesus. It, it would be those that have grown bitter and turned away from him and stopped warning others that he's coming. It even points out those who would be priests. You can read for yourself our... Um, English translations kind of uh, soften the words a bit, but instead of, um, well, this is what God's word says, it says that those who would fail to do so, he would splatter their faces with manure, and he would throw them on the manure pile to remind them what they have been sent to do, because they have turned bitter against him. Finally, I'd also like you to look at uh, chapter 3, verses uh, 13. Chapter 3, verse 13, it begins our reading for today. You have said terrible things about me, God said, says the Lord. But you say, what do you mean? What do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what's the use in serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands? Or what have we gained by trying to show the Lord of heaven's armies that we're sorry for our sin? Another English translation simply says, it's vain to serve God. It's vain to serve God to confess our sin. In other words, even in a straightforward English translation, it's worthless to serve you, God. It's worthless to confess our sins because you're not showing us anything in return. Here's the description of a bitter person, a bitter Christian. Um, now, we live in a, in a society, a time, and a place, even in a country, even in a community, maybe even in a church, that is built in some respects, we are, built on um, consumerism. It's how we live our life, right? We, uh, we buy things, we trade things, we work hard to get a return, right? We go to work to get a paycheck. We use that paycheck to buy things that we, that we need or that we want. Uh, everything is kind of a, I do this and then I get something in return. Uh, it's true, right? It's just how we live. It's how we survive. It's how we do things. We become consumers, and we're consumers of goods. Things that are more valuable to us, we'll spend more for. We'll work a little harder so that we can spend more for them. 
uh, sadly, our relationship with God has turned into something of this. Right? Our relationship with God can sometimes fall into this terrible spot where we say, God, I do this for you. I want something in return. And if I don't get it in return, I get a little bitter. And I say, what value is it? That's what the word says. Or we say, uh, what good is it when I look around and I see other people that are succeeding and here I'm working hard to serve you, Lord, and I'm not succeeding. God, pay up. Give me something in return. And, and God's word says, I will give you something in return. I will come on the last day and, and I will give you the greatest victory ever known. And until that, we wait and we grow bitter in this waiting. God, I'll go to church and I'll give to you, so now you give me something in return. And the bitterness continues to grow. There's also this final category, and it is uh, described at the end, toward the end of chapter 3. We look at those who are boldly turning against him. We look at those who have grown bitter. And then we also look at those who are blessed. Obviously, this is where we want to see ourselves. But oftentimes we consider the word blessed in a different way, not in a biblical way. Um, We consider it uh, those who are blessed because they got a a raise. Or we consider somebody blessed because they were born into the right family. Or we consider somebody blessed by God uh, because everything seems to go well for them. Uh, But that's not really what's being described here. Uh, Here's how... God's word describes those who are blessed. It says, uh, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. Uh, I, I want to remind you that we just did that. In a very practical way, we stood up and we spoke with one another. Uh, we spoke with one another in opposite ways of chapter 2 when we pointed out sin and we confessed our sins. In the presence of one another, we spoke to God about that confession of sins. And the Lord listened to what we said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about the honor of his name. Maybe I'm pushing the text a little bit, but we will absolutely come into his presence. We will come into his presence here and receive his gifts. We... um, We then read this, uh, they will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On the day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure, priceless treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Here's what it means to be blessed by God. Even that we would turn against and away from our bold actions against him and confess our sins to him. Even when we would turn away from our bitter actions toward him, and we would confess our sins to him. And we would come and we would repent before God and wait again. And while we wait, we hear this news. This news yet again that he is, sees us as his, uh, his special treasure, his priceless treasure. And he would spare us as a father would spare an obedient child. And this is his point. He did not spare his own child. He sent his own, son, his own child, his own son, Jesus Christ, to come and take your, take your sins upon himself. And because he's taken your sins upon himself, he sees you as his special treasure, even while we wait. It is the last Sunday of the church year, and it's, a, it's kind of a, a tough season of readings because it's reminding us that we're waiting for a, a victory that is far greater than any that we would ever know. Right? We're waiting on that final victory when Jesus would come in judgment for sure, but also in grace and in mercy and forgiveness for those who belong to him. But while we wait on this, we realize that we fall into a, a bold sin. We realize that we fall into bitterness. We realize that we do all this, but here's what God calls you even today. He calls you his precious treasure his priceless possession. He calls you blessed, not because you wait so patiently, not because you serve so wonderfully, but because you come and confess your sins to him again and again.
because you come in repentance and turn from your boldness and turn from your bitterness. And he calls you forgiven. He calls you holy. He calls you his priesthood of all believers. And he says to you, uh, not just wait, but he says to you, uh, joyfully serve me because you are forgiven. You are forgiven of all of your sins. You are my precious treasure because of Jesus. That's who you are. It's great to worship with you again today. We continue our worship with an opportunity to give our tithes and offerings to the Lord that his work would continue, even thrive in this place. Amen.